I want to share a, a couple of things with you here, and uh, and and uh, they got four points to share with you. One, there is a war. Two, we're called to surrender and have dedication. Three, we're to be equipped with the army, uh, armor of God and the gifts of God for the fight. And fourth, the battle is the Lord's. All of it's the Lord's in spite of that. And, um, but the first thing is that there's a war going on. If, if, you don't if you look at what's going on in the world right now, you won't understand the confusion and the chaos and why there's uh, factions rising up against factions in Canada and other places in the world. You won't get it unless you understand there's a war going on that's in the heavenlies. And what happens is, as the powers of darkness operate in the heavenlies and they influence people, and uh, they get those peoples into position of authority, they can move things around, and they start to create the chaos that we're experiencing right now. And what we had in the past is over. We're in that place right now where there's a battle on. And uh, as I said uh, a bit earlier on there, there is an agenda that's been well announced. It's been published. It's been printed in books. And basically by 2030, the agenda is that they will take control of the earth. And um, I'm not going to get into all that stuff, but I've seen it. I've read it. I've watched their videos as they discussed it uh, and uh, the people that are going to do it. And... Um, it's underway right now. That's the plan, and it involves all this stuff about the Great Reset and everything else. There is a war, but it, that's, that is the earthly manifestation of what's going on in the heavenlies. Uh, the devil wants to get control of everything, and now that he's got a foot in the door, it's, he's getting more and more in the door until he, he gets it all, you see. And um, that explains some of the wild, rising kind of hatred and vitriol and, and accusation that you see sometimes. It doesn't even make sense. And you go, how can they say that? Because there's way more to it than what you'd see in the natural. Whether natural, you go, this doesn't make sense. How can it be like that? But if you look at the spiritual, you get it. And believe me, there are people in high places that are serving other gods. They are serving other gods. There are people that are doing that. I mean, for... You might not have noticed this while it went by, but when the people in the you know Black Lives Matter and, and all those other places, when they took the knee, taking the knee is worship. Do you know that? That's what the word worship means, to bow down, to take the knee. It's not to have a slow song. Uh, it's to get yourself down. Um, in America, you might not know this, Congress opened the first session this year uh, with dedication to the god Brahma. You might not know that. You can go watch it on YouTube. This is a different time, folks. This is a change. But the commander of the army of the Lord of Hosts has shown up. And he's saying, who is with me? You know? I'm not with them or them. Who is with me? Right? Who is with me? And so it says, like in, in 1 Peter, uh, let me find this here, 1 Peter uh, four three. I'm going to go there right now. It's it's uh, it was also in that uh, Peter. I'm going to find Peter. Got to get used to my old Bible again. <laughs> he says that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, keep sane and sober in your prayers and hold above all unfailing love for one another uh, since love covers a multitude of sins. The end things of, uh, of all things are at hand. Later on he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon you as, uh, to, to prove you. And, uh, and then earlier he says, um, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with this thought that whoever suffers in the flesh is ceased from sin to live the rest of the time, not in the flesh, fulfilling human passions, but by the will of God. Let the time of the past be sufficient for doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in licentiousness, passion, drunkenness, revelings, crowdy, crowsing, and lawless idolatry. And they're surprised that you don't join them now. So, secondly, is there is a surrender and a dedication that takes place. There's a dedication to the Lord that takes place. I, I'm convinced that right now what God is saying to the church, like, like we said up here was, uh, I want you to do business with me. I want you to do business with me. When the world goes crazy and everything's out of joint and the, and the powers of darkness 
uh, get an upper hand, you look at the Bible pattern, and what you see is when God's people would come with the Lord and do business with him, then God began to move on their behalf. Like you look in, uh, I won't read the passage, it's quite long, but uh, King Joash in the Old Testament, um, he was a young man when he became king, eight years old, and he had kind of a heart for the Lord, but the land was filled with idolatry. Solomon had even, put, this is King Solomon, had even put uh, images of bulls to worship on top of the temple. They had temple prostitutes working, male temple prostitutes working, in the t out of the temple in Jerusalem. This is all the stuff that was going on. And uh, you can read it all in that passage, all the stuff. But he had, this Joash had a heart for the Lord. And for the next eight years, till he was 16, he started uh, having the clean up. He wanted to see worship of God come back. And he started to clean things up. And he, he uh, got rid of a lot of the stuff that was going on. But he didn't have a full mind of what was up because they didn't have the law. The law had been lost. The writings of the law had been lost to them. And so while they're cleaning out the temple, one of the priests finds the law of God. And they look at it and go, oh my goodness. And they bring it to the, to the main priest. And he brings it to Joash. And they read it. And, they, and, and he tears his clothes. Oh my God. What have we done? And he realizes by reading the law of God that what they were experiencing as a nation had come because they had turned their back on God. And they had, had gone in worship of other gods. They killed their children's in, in offerings to Molech and, and, and um, all this stuff had gone on. And uh, he begins to seek the Lord and he gathers all the people together and they do business with God. He realizes what the problem is and they do business with God. Namely, they come, they humble themselves, they repent of their sin and their ancestors' sin and ask God to forgive. And not only that, he doesn't just confess the sin and the people with them. They also repent, which means they forsake the sin. And then they make a, he, they cleanse the land. They, he tears down the Asherahs. He tears down the idols. He defiles the, the altars of all the other gods. He, does, he just goes everywhere and the people with him, stopping all the stuff they've been doing because the people covenanted with God at that point to walk the way God wanted. What I perceive is happening right now is that's the point we're at. God wants his church to now stand with him and we covenant, we will walk with you. We'll not walk the way the world is. There's such a mix going on in the church right now. And when we do business with God, it's very simple. It doesn't mean we have to have some high spiritual experience or an encounter like we're having this morning or whatever else. To do business with God is real easy. You have the promise of God and you follow it and do it. God sees you do it and he responds. It's that simple. In 1 John it says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive your sin and he cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So when you sin... If you come solemnly and humbly before him and say, God, I've sinned, this is wrong. It doesn't matter if it's just now or you did it way in the past and you know you need to deal with it. You do business with God. When you confess that sin and forsake it, in other words, I'm not just saying this so I can go back and do it again. When you do that, he sees you doing what he says in the word you do and he forgives you. He cleanses you, as the Bible says, from all unrighteousness. That's, see, that's one example of doing business with God. You don't have to feel anything. You don't have to be emotional. You might be. You might feel his presence. You might not. It doesn't even matter. Because you've done the business with God, it's done. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. And what God is saying is, now is the time for the church to do business with God. If you have sin or a history of sin or something that's never been dealt with, you do business with God. You get it straightened out so you can say, yes, Lord, this is what I did. Or even take your family's sin, as Daniel confessed the sins of the whole nation that led them into captivity. If you read the book of Daniel, he confessed his own sin, it says, when he was, here's what happened. He read the prophecies of Isaiah that said they'd be in captivity for 70 years. He's saying, oh my goodness, 70 years is up. He must have been an old man by then. He must have been 90 years old or 80 years old or something because he, he came as a young man from the, in the captivity. 
he says, Lord, I see time's up. And then he starts to confess his own sin, whatever that might be, and the sins of the people and the history before the Lord. And that opens the door for the next thing God wants to do. God hears the prayers of Daniel and others with him. God then releases the next step, which was in Isaiah, which was King Cyrus issues a decree that they could go back to Jerusalem. God wants to sweep the earth. Jesus is coming as commander of the army of the Lord. He wants to sweep away the powers of the darkness, but we have to ask why they're here. They're here because they've been allowed to be here, because the church allowed them to be here, because we've allowed sin or whatever in our life, or our family's life, or whatever. And, that, and he says, now, you know what? You're coming out of the wilderness. You've coming across the desert. It's time the circumcision. It's time for you to take that stand. We are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. We're not going back. We're not going to live this way anymore. It's over. And do business with God. God's calling his church to do that right now. I've done this sort of thing numbers of times in different places with marvelous results over specific issues. And uh, he's saying to do it again. We start to do it again. That's number one. That's my first point that I want to say. Or that's the second point. First point was is there is a war. Second is surrender and dedication. The third point is there is equipment of the armor of God that he supplies, like that song, strong in the strength that he supplies through his eternal son, right? And uh, so let's, I'll go to 2 Corinthians 10 here, 2 Corinthians 10, 4. Though we live in the world, we are not carrying on a worldly war. I don't know if I, I didn't think I'd give it to you. Though we live in the world, we're not carrying on a worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, or carnal is another word. They're not worldly, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ and are ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Do you know that there are arguments of darkness and Satan being used right now to take captive uh, Canadians? That is going on. The media are often false prophets and are used that way. And, and, uh, but what he says is this, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's like when there's prayer, why pray for the parliament? Why walk around the the parliament buildings. I've been there. I've done prayer walks around the parliament. I've been inside and, and prayed. Uh, in fact, I had, a, I had a vision decades ago when I was there one time, and I'd come back to my room where I was staying, and um, I, I had this vision, and what I saw was the House of Commons, and, and it's in session, and all the members are sitting there, and I see all these lights, bright, sparkly lights flying through the air over top of them. And I go, God, what is this? What am I seeing? And, uh, and he said to me, this is the House of Commons at rest. The government, pardon me, this is the government of Canada at rest. And everything's set in order. And then I had understanding. What I was seeing as the lights going back and forth was good spiritual activity. The inspiration of God coming to the different members of the House of Commons and our parliament to inspire them with what we need, the answers we need for our government and for the nation. And I take that. I say, yes, Lord, I'm praying for that one. That will come one day in the name of Jesus. There will be a mighty revival and we have our people in Parliament be filled with the Holy Spirit. Is that too much to ask? No. That's the kind of stuff that started happening with Charles Wesley and John Wesley, the transformation they wrought in a nation that was upon the brink of a, re a, a, a revolution like France had. It could have gone that way, the bloody French Revolution, but because the revival came in Britain. Instead, they went towards God. It saved them, you know. It ultimately, you know, it, as it went on, decades later, it ended slavery. 
There was an overturning of the dark things that have been institutionalized, and the light of God began to shine. And uh, we kind of take it for granted because we inherited those things, but they're all being eaten away now. And he says here that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but powerful in the gifts, the mighty power of the Holy Spirit. And uh, we don't, we, we're living in the world, yes. We're in the middle of this thing. But it's not a worldly war that's going on. We, destroy, we have this power to destroy strongholds. There are strongholds of thinking. They can come on us too. But the strongholds of thinking that are going on in our nation right now. There are strongholds of thinking that uh, need to be torn down. But he says we have divine power to tear down the strongholds. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. I won't get into that right now. Except to say in, in, the, in the figure of the Roman soldier's armor, helmet of salvation, a breastplate of righteousness, a, uh, a belt of truth, uh, feet shod with equipping the gospel of peace, a shield of faith, and a sword of the spirit, the word of God, the defensive weapons, and then the offensive weapons, the word of God for this fight that we're in. And God, the Lord, wants to equip us also with gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, of the words of wisdom, words of knowledge, miracles, healings, you know, all kinds of things, faith, and you name it. We've had some gifts going on. The prophetic's going on, you know, and, and we've had the, uh, uh, the, the, the word in tongues, a message in unknown tongues. That's what we heard. And then the interpretation is what, what I gave. That's one of the gifts that God used me with was the interpretation of tongues. And so what happens in a meeting is if, if someone else is not given that, I say, well, Lord, if, give it to me. And he does. And, and it's... Strange, but happens, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, it, it's, he wants to equip us. And then uh, he wants us to be able to go forth, go forth in the name of Jesus and um, know that the battle is the Lord's. Uh, I was thinking about, um, what are we doing with time? Almost done. Uh, the story of, of, um, who am I looking at? 2 Chronicles 20. This is such an interesting story, and I might just touch a bit on it for you. Um, this is the story of Jehoshaphat. And most of us remember the story because they put the singers up in front of the army and all that. But uh, here it is. 2 Chronicles 20. Um, after this, some Moabites, Ammonites, and Muonites, or Mount Seir would be another place they kind of call it, came towards wage war against Jehoshaphat, and a great multitude's coming from Edom and beyond the sea, and, and he says they're at Hazian Geder, and Jehoshaphat feared about this horde coming to, and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast through all Judah, and Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord. And all the cities of Judah came to seek the Lord. Okay, that is doing business with God. Okay? He set himself to seek the Lord. He feared. He feared what could happen. This army can destroy them. He set himself to seek the Lord. And the people came. And, uh, and they began to pray, Lord God, our fathers, are, are you not the God in heaven? Do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations? In all power and might, none is able to withstand you. And did you not say to us, O Lord, drive out the inhabitants of this land? And then later on, he says that uh, they wouldn't let them dwell out these three nations. And I'll tell you why in a minute. And you said, listen to this, this is verse 9, If evil comes upon us, the sword, that's, that's this army, judgment, pestilence, famine, we could stand before your house and before thee, your name is in this house, we could cry out to you in our affliction, and you would hear and save. Okay, there, this is the thing about doing business with God I touched on earlier. You said, Lord, when these things happen, we could cry out to you, and you would hear us and save. And now behold the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came into the land from the land of Egypt, uh, who we avoided and did not destroy. Behold, they are coming to drive us out. 
And we are powerless against this great multitude that's coming against us. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Who, who are these three nations? Well, Moab, uh, uh, pardon me, um, uh, Moab is the nation that came from the incestuous uh, relationship of Lot and his oldest daughter. Remember? when they fled from Sodom and Gomorrah, had no place, and the daughter said, we're not going to have any descendants, and they got their father drunk and had, you know, incense cessed. And, and so they remained like an incestuous nation and full of idol worship and, and immorality and perversion of every kind. That's what they're about. And then um, Ammon is the incestuous relationship, the descendants of Lot's youngest daughter. And then Mount Seir are the descendants of uh, Esau, who despised God's birthright. So what you've got is incestuous, perverted sexuality, idol worship, on and on and on that those lands had developed. And the people of God were, not, were, were to live beside them, not to attack them because they were descendants of Abraham. And then the other group, Mount Seir, are again idol worshippers and everything else, but they don't fear the Lord. They despise the things of God. Now what, what struck me about reading this is this is a lot like our culture where we as Christians have coexisted with all this kind of thing in our culture rising up for many, many years. You know, okay, freedom, you know, sexual choice, and all the different things that have gone on, and it's got worse and worse and worse, till now, they are trying to wipe us out. You follow me? And now we're going, we're powerless to do anything. So, anyway, they assembled, the Spirit of God came on Jehaziel, it tells his lineage, son of Zechariah, Benaiah, Janiah, da 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 and here's what he said, hearken to, uh, hearken all of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, do not be afraid, do not be dismayed at this multitude. The battle is not yours, but the Lord's. Tomorrow go down against them and you, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz and you'll find them at the end of the valley east of the wilderness Jurel. Remember, they, they don't know where these people are going to come from and where the, how the attack's going to happen next. They don't know what the situation's going to do. And God says, go stand there. Stand still. You won't need to fight. Stake your positions and see the victory of the Lord on your behalf. So now, they have the prophet declaring this. The question will be, will they believe the word of God? Will they believe the prophets? Will they do as it says, or will they try to pull together their own army and go out and fight? Right? We've had a lot of that in our culture right now. The church has tried to rise up and fight all this stuff going on in our culture. It hasn't worked. It's come out worse. But look, here's what happened. So the next day, uh, they head on out down to the valley, and uh, Jehoshaphat says to them, Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe the Lord your God, you will be established. Believe, believe his prophets, you will succeed. And then he took counsel with the people, and the people said, let's put the singers out in front. That's cool. They got faith. And, and Joshua says, yes, let's do it. And off they go, and then when they went out, they began to sing and praise the Lord in holy array. And as they went before the army, they were singing, Give thanks to the Lord, his steadfast love endures forever. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who'd come up against Judah, and they were routed, not, not by the armies of Israel. The men of Ammon and Moab ran, rose up against Mount Seir and destroyed them, and when they'd made an end of them, they destroyed each other. And not a man was left standing. And then when they got there and saw what had happened, they found it took three days to take away the spoil. They were planning to move in. Do you, do you see some parallels going on? The plans that are afoot in the earth 
right now is to take over and move in. I'm telling you, this stuff's all up. It is right now. It, it's, it's there. And uh, yet the Lord is saying, the battle's not yours. Stand fast and see the salvation of God. So right now what he's doing is saying, who will stand with me? You know, who is going to purify their life and their heart and their ways? Who is going to make done of those other things and stand and say, yes, sir, I want to be yours 100%. And then follow him step by step, follow the commander of the army of the Lord, whatever the plan is. That wouldn't be necessarily the same thing Jehoshaphat had. But whatever the plan is, what's next? What's next? What's next? You see, that's the place we're at right now, I believe, in, in, the, uh, in the church and in the kingdom of God right now. It's such an incredible time to be living. You're thinking, uh, I just like it all peaceful like it was. No, it's not going to be anymore. It's gonna be this, uh, we're going to have probably some much more difficult times ahead. You know? And uh, I was thinking a little bit about uh, Justin Trudeau and, and uh, you know, praying for him and stuff. And I'm thinking, why is he digging in like he did and all this stuff around the mandates and everything else? And, and then I thought about uh, um, Pharaoh and Moses and all those stories, you know. And what came to my mind was, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Why didn't Pharaoh just let him go at the start? And here's an interesting thing. It went worse and worse and worse and worse for the Israelites until they finally were free. But the reason it says in Exodus, God did it that way, was so that he would have victory over the gods of the Egyptians. It wasn't about Pharaoh at all, you see. And that's what it says. It's not about flesh and blood. What God was up to was getting a victory over the gods of Egypt. There's much, much more going on than meets the eye. And so, you know, we keep on praying for our government and those that are in authority. We pray for them to turn to the Lord. And they may. Uh, but we know that the war is not at the ground level that we see. There's much more to it. There's much, much more to it. So I, I want to just close here, I think, with some prayer. And I uh, wanted to leave you that. One of the things, just as, as I finish here, um, is on my heart great deal lately is to and and I'm looking to to set up e an evening meeting once a week where we would pursue this I'm looking for a place to do it and whoever would come would come and we just do four things and uh, one of them uh, initially is um, trying to remember how, how I'd put it before. Let me, let me just say, I had a way to say it that I thought was interesting. And uh, maybe I'm not supposed to share it, I don't know. But um, in doing business with God, it's, oh, here it is. Um, to get our soul right with God, number one. That's what it'd be about, just getting our soul right with God. Number two, get our body right with God. Our soul right with God is having everything clear and right, maybe people getting saved, but our body right with God is healing, miracles, whatever is wrong, deliverance. Number three, get the gifts of God. Number four, just get out for God. Go, go, <laughs> your commission, go and, go and do your work, and just to do those four things as a way of equipping the body. And I see this as the, like citywide or whoever, not, not denominational, not any of those things. It's just like, man, oh man, it's time. We need to do this. And uh, let's do it, you know. And I believe that God's on it for this day right now. And uh, anyway, Father, as I've shared all this, I believe that your spirit is working right here in our midst and touching the hearts of people all through the congregation and maybe some that will listen online. And uh, you want us, we sense the call right now. Father, we've also felt ourselves badgered back and forth and up and down by all the powers and principalities and the things going on in the heavenly places, trying to upset everything and make a mess. But Lord, we're saying yes to you. Today we say yes to you, Lord. We don't know how to walk this out. 
except the battle's yours. It's not ours. And what you have ahead, I know you promise prophetically, is, a, is, is, is revival times are here. So we say yes to you, Lord, as we move ahead. We give you and surrender you everything in our life in Jesus' name. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. And uh, I just close on this. I feel like the Holy Spirit is going to take the things that I've shared, and uh, for some of you, he's just going to suddenly touch you with a reminder of it because there's things he's going to go, you know, and um, he's, he's, he's doing his work. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen.